Hey everybody, it is You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from Leonard Euler One, who says, Why Hillary over Bernie? None of this lightning round nonsense. Get into them details, please. And uh, Leonard was far from the only person to ask for more details on why I said I would vote for Hillary instead of Bernie. Um, actually, it would depend on the circumstances. Um, if you're asking me who would I, or I guess not depends on the circumstances, it, it would depend on what I'm voting for and what you're really asking me. If you're asking me who would I vote for if it was between Hillary and Bernie and they were the only two people running and that was the only election that there was, then I would vote for Bernie. I think I think he is a little bit more in line with my politics than, than Hillary is. He's more a little bit more progressive, more of a leftist than, than Hillary is. But here's the thing. I'm not registered as a Democrat. I'm registered as non-affiliated, which means in the state where I live, Maryland, that I don't get to vote in Republican or Democratic primaries. We have closed primaries here in Maryland. So I don't get to vote in the Hillary versus Bernie election. I only get to vote in the Hillary or Bernie versus some Republican asshole election in November of 2016. And in that election, I would really prefer the Democratic candidate to be Hillary because I don't think the Republicans have anyone who could really stand a chance against Hillary. Now, I don't say that to be cocky. I don't want prospective Democratic voters to just take Hillary's victory for granted and not go vote. It's very important to go vote for Hillary if you want Hillary to win the election on Election Day in 2016. Don't let me you know, make anybody feel complacent, because I know I have that kind of influence over the electorate. Um, but I think Hillary is a much stronger candidate, a much more electable candidate, and I feel like Bernie's role, and I'm far from the first person to say this, pretty much everybody has said this, uh, Bernie's biggest use in the primaries would be to pull Hillary further to the left, uh, to make her a little bit more of a liberal, uh, progressive candidate. Not that she's not liberal or progressive already. It always kind of makes me chuckle when people say that Hillary isn't a liberal or Hillary isn't, uh, that, when Hil that Hillary is either a centrist or some people even say Hillary is like a conservative, which just blows my mind. I just don't get that at all. Uh, certainly the conservatives don't consider Hillary to be a conservative. Um, but no, in, in a perfect world where it was, if it was just Hillary versus Bernie running for president, I would probably vote for Bernie. But, uh, if we're talking about who is going to win a primary election against a Republican candidate who will have a ton of money and uh, support backing him up, I would rather see Hillary be that person because I think Hillary has the best shot to win. And Hillary is who I expect to be voting for when I vote in the general election next year. Sire A. No. Hey, Steve. Quantum Leap was brought up on this show recently, and I just watched the pilot episode, which brings me to this question. In the second half of the pilot episode, Sam calls his father because his father is still alive in the year he has leaped into. In order to have conversation with him, Sam pretends to be a long-lost relative. My question is, if you were in that situation, admittedly unlikely, would you come up with a cover story to get to talk to this person, or would you try to explain the truth to them that you had executed the world's first successful time travel experiment? I would probably use the cover story like Sam did for a couple reasons. First, in Sam's situation, if you remember, uh, he's making that phone call and he's leapt into the baseball player and he's calling like from the payphone in the, the, the corridor behind the dugout. So I didn't get the impression he, that he had all day to talk and who knows how long his father had to talk. So he was crunched for time. Uh, and the second reason is kind of related to the first reason, which is if you make your phone call about you as a time traveler in the 50s calling your father, uh, assuming you can convince your father that that is true, how the fuck is the conversation about anything else? I don't think that Sam had leapt back in time and saw his opportunity to call his dad and hear his dad's voice on the phone and talk to his dad, and he thought, oh, I know what I want to talk to my dad about. I'll tell him about my time travel experiment. I just don't think that was what he was wanting to talk about. And how do you, how do you move on quickly from that point in the conversation? How do you go from, hey, dad, it's your son from the future, but I came back in time because I am now the world's first time traveler? How do you go from there to, so how's mom, you know? So I, I think I would just leave that whole thing out and just do the cover story. 
Mr. John 136, thank you very much for answering my last question. My friend and I are aspiring filmmakers that are both going to study film at our universities of choice. My friend has even been given the opportunity to go to film school in LA. What is one thing you would recommend for the both of us to do while at university and while making films? I find that the biggest issue with modern filmmaking is the lack of visual storytelling. Films are very weighed down with dialogue and exposition. Interstellar comes to mind as the best example of this issue. What is your biggest issue with modern filmmaking? What would you do to remedy that issue as either a director or screenwriter? Well, first of all, as students, I would encourage you both to, uh, to get as familiar with as many practical uh, aspects of filmmaking as you possibly can. If you're going to be, if you're going to film school and, and you're aspiring to be a director or a screenwriter or whatever, um, take as many classes as you, as you can fit into your schedule about practical stuff, about how to run the camera, about how to set up lights, about how to do sound. Uh, do, get as much technical know-how as you possibly can. Not only because having those skills might help you find a job in the industry if uh, you have trouble you know, selling your script or, or getting a job as a director, uh, but also because all of that know-how will inform your job if you do get to become a writer or you do get to become a director at some point in the future. If you have that practical experience, not only would you be able to sort of step in and work with people on their level and you'd know what you were talking about, but it would inform you as an artist. Uh, so take as, learn as much technical stuff as you possibly can while you're pursuing the more creative artistic stuff. Um, the biggest issue with modern filmmaking, uh, I think you're onto something in terms of lack of visual storytelling, um, especially in independent film. There's a lot of really awesome visual stuff going on in big budget Hollywood movies. Now, a lot of it seems very similar. There's a lot of homogeny going on uh, in big budget Hollywood movies, but a lot of them have very strong visuals and a lot of them are being made by very striking, talented, creative visual stylists, visual directors. Uh, you mentioned Christopher Nolan as an example of someone who uses too much heavy exposition and I would probably agree with you, but he is also an example of a very visually skilled director. He is a really, really powerful director visually and in terms of, of editing and, and presenting a story and propelling a story along, uh, especially when it gets like to action sequences and moments of uh, of tension or suspense and that 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 kind of thing, um, so he's a, he, he's good to emulate there. Not so much with uh, the the exposition laden uh, scripts that he shoots, um, but visual storytelling is something that a lot of independent filmmakers sort of uh, forget. You know, they they're very married to the story. They're very married to the writing and to the characters and to the exploration of the human condition. And all of that is wonderful, and I love all of that. But sometimes I feel like a lot of low-budget independent filmmakers forget that film is a visual medium first and foremost, and a movie has to tell its story through the visuals. Primarily, that's just my taste. That's just how I think it should be. And the other, the other bits have to follow the visuals. Have to be led by the visuals. So I agree with you. I think visual filmmaking is is of utmost importance. Um, and the best way to remedy that as a director and a screenwriter really is just to do what you will probably be doing in film school, which is to watch a shitload of movies by people who are of all kinds of different film filmmaking styles, and learn what they're doing and how they're doing it and why they do what they do, why they make the particular choices they make, why they put the camera here instead of here, why they use this camera move instead of that camera move, why they pick that kind of lighting, that particular color scheme, whatever, and then apply that to the kind of stories that you want to tell. That's the best, the best film education anybody can get, whether you're getting it in film school or whether you're just doing it yourself uh, in your own time, you're, you want to be a filmmaking autodidact, is just to watch tons of movies and to endeavor to understand what they're doing and how and why they're doing it. Little Panda, I'd be interested in your view of age restriction laws in general. If I can do calculus, taxes, cook a tiramisu unsupervised, work a register, and perform all the necessary tasks to function as an adult, I think there should be some test that would allow me to demonstrate that and allow me to show that I can make rational, informed, and reasonable decisions about my own future. If one is judging by brain development or rational decision making, I think the cutoff age should be either 25 or 14, but I simply don't see why the age 18 is particularly special, and of course, 
pregnancy is a simple enough thing to prevent as long as one is permitted to do so. Uh, by the way, Little Panda, uh, in, in the full unedited comment, discloses uh, that uh, she is underage. So, um, well, the thing about laws is they have to apply to everybody in a broad sense, and it's difficult to make them so exact that they would perfectly suit every person in every situation. And I think age discrimination laws are a perfect example of that. In, a, in, a, in an ideal world where we could reliably determine the emotional and intellectual maturity of every person regardless of their chronological age, sure, maybe you could do away with them. And you could say, well, this person is 16, she's super mature. This person is 20, he has no idea what the fuck he's doing. You know, the this person is considered an adult, this person, eh, a few more years for him. Uh, that, that might work in an ideal world, but we don't live in an ideal world. And the law has to sort of set a line, set a limit, to say, okay, anyone who's younger than this is considered a minor and is given more protection under the law and is given uh, fewer privileges and anyone who is older than this is considered an adult and is treated accordingly. And it's not perfect. It certainly doesn't line up with everyone's emotional or intellectual maturity. Uh, some people are probably ready to be treated as adults long before they're 18. Some people probably aren't ready to be treated as adults well into their 20s or 30s. Um, but you have to f come up with an age that would apply to the majority of people, that would be a reasonable age to consider someone an adult. Uh, and yeah, maybe, I mean, 18 isn't a magic age. Why not 17? Why not 19? I don't know, but 18 is what we came up with and it's not perfect. It doesn't, it, it doesn't suit everybody, but for a population of hundreds of millions of people as the United States has, uh, it works probably about as well as any other age would. Turing Machine. Hey Steve, what's up? I believe you mentioned that you didn't go straight to college after graduating from high school. Why is that? Did you feel you weren't ready for it? I have a nephew who's definitely not ready for college. His mom is bent on him going straight to college. I personally think joining the workforce for a couple of years would give him an appreciation of how the real world works and make him value education. He's going to end up extremely disappointed at himself, and I don't need to tell you how most teenagers deal with failure of this level. What's your opinion? Were you in any way like that? Yeah, I think the reason why I didn't go straight to college from high school is I, I definitely just was not emotionally ready for it. My, my head just was not in the right place. I was never like a troubled kid. Um, I'd never struggled in school either in terms of my grades or, you know, socially. Um, but I just had a really shitty attitude about high school and about education. I, I really felt like I was above it, like I was smarter than most of my fellow students, like I was smarter than my teachers, like I wasn't really learning anything, like it was all a waste of time, and I just wanted to get it over with. And by the time high school was over with and I had graduated, the last thing I wanted to do was go straight to college. So I did work for uh, about seven or eight years. Uh, before I went back to college. And it, I think that's the only way I could have done it, given how I was in my life at that point. Uh, because by the time I did go to college, I had that appreciation for education that you say you would hope your nephew would have after working for a few years. I really did value my college experience in a way that I would not have valued it if I had gone straight there from high school, I would have seen it as a chore, I would have seen it as work, as something that I had to do rather than something that I wanted to do, which is how it ultimately was when I finally got there. So for me, that was the perfect solution. Some people are ready for college as soon as they're done with high school. Some people are raring to go. They see that as the next step in their life, and that's wonderful, and I wish them all the luck in the world. Uh, but yeah, for other people, it might help to take a few years to work, to, to do something else, to, to get out of school, and then if they decide to go back into school, they'll appreciate it all the more, and, and they'll get a lot more out of it because they'll have a, a much better attitude. At least that was, that was my experience. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen with your nephew. I, I hope that your predictions about his, his future in school, if he, if he decides to go straight to college, are not, uh, do, do not come true, as I'm sure you hope as well. I wish him the best of luck. Androgynous buttocks. 
What are your opinions on these anti-natalist arguments, i.e. life is imposed upon the child, with life comes suffering, and you should not have kids if you can't guarantee its well-being, which of course you never can. In light of the ever-nearing approaching issues brought by overpopulation, it's wise to be an anti-natalist as a means of com combating the issue of overpopulation, but what are your opinions on the more moral anti-natalist arguments? Well, I'm not an anti-natalist. I don't support anti-natalism or subscribe to that idea uh, philosophically or morally. You can say with life comes suffering, that's true, uh, but you could also flip that around and say with life comes joy, with life comes experience, with life comes ecstasy. There are so many wonderful things that come with life that come right along with all the shitty, horrible, depressing stuff. Uh, and you can never tell how much of either you're going to get. If you're, if you're a person in the world, you're probably going to experience a fair bit of both. Hopefully you'll have more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. Uh, but you can never tell until you get here. And, uh, you know, as far as life being imposed on the living, yeah, you don't have a choice as to whether or not you're born. I, to me, that's, that's just an inescapable part of the nature of human existence. I don't see that necessarily as an argument against having kids. I do think it's a very, very excellent argument, both morally and economically and in terms of overpopulation, to encourage people to not have children that they don't really want and that they can't afford to take care of. Now, you're right, you can't guarantee that you'll be able to care for a child. You can't guarantee that uh, you will be able to guard a child's well-being. You may turn out to be a really terrible parent. You may find yourself facing unforeseen circumstances that limit your ability to care for a child. Uh, you might lose your job. A kid might be more expensive than you thought it would be. The child might have medical problems that, that overwhelm you. There's no guarantee about any of it. But going in to the uh, parenting experience, if you don't really, really, really want to have kids and you are not at least in a situation where it is realistic that you could care for the child, then you should not be having children. Now, I don't think that this should be imposed on you by the government. I don't think that there should be laws limiting how many children people should have. I do think we can have measures through the tax code, let's say, to encourage these sorts of behaviors. And I think culturally, we should start encouraging people that that should be the standard. If you want to have children, by all means, have children. But if you don't want children, don't have children. And if you can't afford to care for your children, don't have children. Birth control is so easy. And I think we should make it easier. I think we should make it even more available than it is, believe me. Uh, but it's pretty widely available as it is. So we should be encouraging people to only have children if they really, really want to be parents and if they can really afford to be parents. And I think that's a moral argument and I think that's also a great argument uh, against, uh, to counteract, to fight the, the growing problem of overpopulation. Mr. Croup, dear Steve, are you a patriot? What does that mean? What reason would anyone have to love the USA? What would it mean to love the USA or any other nation state for that matter? To my estimation, for whatever it's worth, I do not believe I've heard a response to any such question that does not boil down to the same modes of indoctrination employed by enduring religious traditions. Why should I love this country? I don't know if there are inarguable objective reasons to love the United States or indeed to love any country that anybody might be from. I think a lot of it is cultural uh, conditioning, you might call it indoctrination, maybe in some cases it is indoctrination. Um, why do we love where we come from? Why do we love our home? Why do we love our hometowns? Not all of us love our hometowns, but a lot of us do. Why do, why, why do we do that? Is it because the town itself has some innate quality that makes it worth loving or worth respecting, or is it because that's the place where all of our memories take place? Because that's the place where we grew up. That's the place where we discovered who we were, where we made our friends, where we got to know our parents, where we fell in love, and we associate the place with all those experiences. I think maybe a lot of patriotism is that, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, as long as we know that that's what it is, and we don't then take those feelings and try to turn them into something that argues for our country as being an exceptional place or an objectively superior place. I think that's the problem with patriotism is that so many people take their patriotic feelings for, let's just say, the United States, because that's my country, and they use those to argue that somehow the United States is innately superior 
to other nations. And I think that's a mistake. That's when it becomes destructive. I think it's perfectly fine to love the United States because it's where you're from, because it's your home, because you love the land, you love the, the, the views, you love being able to travel, you love going to national parks, you love the cities, you love the culture, you love the history, you love the movies, you love the fact that we landed people on the moon, you know? Uh, there are all kinds of things about the United States that you could love. Some of them might strike you as very superficial things, some of them might be extremely subjective, and you may not have had the same experiences as other people who say they love certain things. Um, you might admire the Constitution, you might, as I do, admire our American ideals and uh, grieve when you consider the many, 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 many times that we have fallen far short of those ideals, the many times when we have betrayed those ideals in very disappointing and oftentimes horrifying ways, um, but yet you continue to hold out hope and you continue to admire our ability to change and to grow and to correct our mistakes, not as often as we should, but we still have the ability to do that every once in a while. There's all kinds of stuff about the United States to love, but none of it is objective, none of it is inarguable, uh, none of it suggests anything innately special about the United States, and I don't think any, any such reason for any other country could be uh, suggested, could be proposed, to, that would say this country is innately superior to another country. This is clearly, objectively, a better country than this other country. I don't think that kind of patriotism is legitimate, and I don't think it should be encouraged. Uh, but the kinds that I just babbled on about for a few minutes, yeah, I think, I think there's nothing necessarily wrong with those. And I think those are all reasons why people might love their countries. I'll tell you another reason why I love my country is because it has created a platform like YouTube that allows idiots like me to pretend that thunderclaps happen in their house when no such claps happen, but then to add the sound effect in post-production to make it sound like it did, and so that I wasn't just reacting to nothing. Also, I can tell you that it is now time for... The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. Yo, Freed, where did Sage Lion go? Why are people with similar views to you get driven out of YouTube while you do just fine? I'm not attacking you, just wondering if you know the reason for the phenomenon. Well, first of all, Sage Lion is no longer going by Sage Lion. If you want to find him, uh, the, the easiest way is probably to go on Twitter. He's uh, uh, Secular Speak, all one word, on Twitter. Go there, find his Twitter handle, and he posts videos on his new YouTube channel on that. That's probably the easiest way to sort of discover all of his new outlets. But he's a Secular Speak. I think on YouTube he's now calling himself a secular thought, but Sage Line is no longer a thing. And as for why is uh, why are people with similar views getting driven out of YouTube while others do just fine? I mean, I have a relatively thick skin when it comes to people hating on me, and when people hate on my friends, my response is usually not to argue with them, but just to block them and forget about them. So that's how I deal with it. It seems to work just fine for me. I, I try not to get drawn too far into petty drama or arguments with fucking trolls. Uh, Winford Lee, hey Steve, what's your thoughts on polygamy and the legality of it? You know, as I was saying earlier in the question about age of consent laws, um, in a perfect world where people involved in polygamous relationships were all completely aware and consenting and on board with the whole thing and being treated fairly and, and, and justly, I wouldn't really have an objection to it, but I fear in practice many, if not most, polygamous relationships are uh, manipulative and exploitive and abusive. Uh, I, I think that's certainly the case for most of the polygamous marriages that are carried out by, you know, let's say, uh, LDS fundamentalists. I just don't think that's a very nice institution. I think it's uh, a very bad, twisted, exploitative institution. Uh, so as long as that's the main form of polygamy, I can't really support that. Otis McNutt III, hey Steve, here's a lightning round question, and it's a bit of a doozy. Super Mario Brothers or The Legend of Zelda? I'm going to go Super Mario Brothers, because actually, unlike maybe some of you guys who are more hardcore gamers than I am, uh, I never really played Zelda. I never really got much of an attachment to it, because I, I just, I never got into it. So I would say Mario Brothers without even having to think about it. Old Comic 1. A war breaks out with the superheroes and villains of the DC Universe against their counterparts in the Marvel Universe. Who wins and why? And who should direct the movie? Um, 
DC wins because in my head I'm writing the movie, <laughs> and I and I, I would I would favor the DC characters because I'm I'm a Superman and Batman guy, uh, but I would make sure that like Spider Man survived because I still like Spidey. Uh, and who should direct the movie right now? I would love to see James Gunn direct such a movie. The guy who directed Super and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I think he would be a really exciting choice to direct a like a super duper smash up superhero movie. Radical Bacon. So, Josh Duggar. Can I stomp on his balls? Well, I'll put it to you this way. If you and I were together someplace and uh, Josh Duggar walked into the room and you turned to me and said, that's Josh Duggar. I'm going to go stomp on his balls. And then you started towards him. I would make no effort whatsoever to restrain you. Bush Basher 85. Most people agree that Jurassic Park is a classic, but feel the sequels are subpar at best. My question is, which one is worse, The Lost World or Jurassic Park 3? Jurassic Park 3, right? Right. I actually don't think The Lost World is that bad. I don't think it's as good as Jurassic Park, but then again, I don't think Jurassic Park is like super duper great either. I think they're both really fun popcorn movies. But yeah, both of them are better than Jurassic Park 3. Adrian Williams, I see you that Hagerstown is having their 20th Blues Fest this weekend. Are you partial to the blues? Yeah, I do like the blues. Actually, one of the reasons why I'm so partial to the blues is because about 10 years ago, my wife and I went to the Blues Fest for the first time. Uh, we went uh, two years, and then we haven't really gone back since. We're not really big concert goers or, or you know, people to go sit in crowds all day and listen to music. But uh, the two years we went were really good. I got to see uh, John Lee Hooker Jr. I got to see Cephas and Wiggins, who I am now like a huge fan of. Uh, unfortunately, John Cephas died a few years ago, but I still am a huge lover of their music. So yeah, I love the blues, and one of the main reasons why I love the particular blues music that I do is because I got really into it after going to the Blues Fest in Hagerstown about 10 years ago. Uh, Warlord27753. I know it's a kind of old series, but I wanted to ask about riffing on mail call. Did you ever get any responses from people you riffed on in the series? It's plausible that at least one person who made a comment in Mail Call has seen your series, so I'm wondering if they ever messaged you or something. Um, no, no one ever got in touch with me because I featured their comment on the series, but um, I'm pretty sure that at least a few people at the Herald Mail were aware of it. Uh, I don't know how they felt about it, but I, I heard from a couple people who would know that that it was at least watched by a few Herald Mail employees. And also one of my <laughs> viewers, uh, one of my longtime subscribers and friends, uh, the Felt Begone, Harold, uh, called in a phony comment uh, <laughs> to Mail Call once, which made, which made the paper. Uh, so that was cool. But no, those, those are really my only riffing on Mail Call stories. Uh, that's it, everybody. That's it for the questions. Before I get out of here, I'm going to give you guys uh, a shout out. I'm going to share a shout out with you. I'm not going to give you guys a shout out. I mean, I guess I could make another video to a completely different audience where I gave you guys a shout out. Um, but that would be silly because you're right here. Anyway, the shout out this week goes to the YouTube channel of the Secular Student Alliance, which is called, cleverly enough, Secular Students. Um, the Secular Student Alliance is currently gearing up for its annual conference, which will take place just about a month from now, on uh, the, uh, the 10th through the 12th of July, on the campus of Ohio State University. It's their big annual event. You can learn all about it by going to their YouTube channel and watching their videos, or by going to their website, secularstudents.org. You can also donate to the organization. It's a nonprofit organization. You can actually donate to support the Secular Student Alliance right from the front page of their YouTube channel up there in the, uh, uh, in the upper right-hand corner. There is a little donation box. You can make a donation to them. Uh, and I would encourage you to do so because the Secular Student Alliance is really one of the best organizations for secularism, for atheism, that there is. Uh, and if you care about the secular atheist community and you want to support a really positive organization that really does some good work for especially young atheists and young secular people support the Secular Student Alliance. It's an awesome organization and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing about their annual conference in July, which I will have to hear about because I'm not going to go because it's just too far and I'm not invited. Uh, but yeah, the Secular Student Alliance could not recommend both the organization and their YouTube channel any more highly than I'm recommending them right now. Uh, so check them out and donate if you feel like it's something 
worth supporting for you. Highly, highly recommend it. So that's the shout out. Those are all the questions. That's the video for this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. And I will answer as many of them as I possibly can in the next video. So until the next video, I'll see you. Take care, everybody.